Chapter 16 of the Posthumous Essays of John Churton Collins. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Posthumous Essays of John Churton Collins. Chapter 16 Browning and Lessing was browning a christian mrs sutherland orr tells us positively that he was not that he was an agnostic and mrs orr knew him personally very intimately and is also profoundly acquainted with his works so of two things we may be sure either that what is meant by the name christian is so vague and indeterminate that it cannot connote what is ordinarily connoted by it, or that most of the fundamental principles and ideas that pervade his writings, when they touch on religious ideas, as well as a large portion of those writings themselves, such as Saul, Cleon, an Epistle of Karshish, Christmas Eve, Easter Day, and a Death in the Desert, are to be regarded as mere aspects of speculative truth and dramatically psychological studies. As for his being an agnostic, the term means anything and indicates nothing at all. Was Lessing a Christian? The superficial answer would be, quote, Certainly not, for did not he describe orthodox christianity as the most frightful structure of nonsense and did he not when almost on his deathbed say call the notary i will declare before him that i die in none of the prevailing religions and was he not at open and furious war with every christian sect and party in germany and yet i venture to think that lessing was a christian in very essential senses of the term he certainly believed in the divine origin of christianity he believed it to be a revelation of unique importance he believed that it embodied immortal truths that it raised the human race on to a higher plane of spiritual and moral activity from which it would not descend but along which it would proceed stage by stage, ever upward, till it reached perfection. And how did Lessing fight the battle of Christianity against its assailants, and teach Browning to fight them too? In Hamburg, when Lessing was living there, died Hermann Samuel Rimeris, a professor of Oriental languages and an eminent scholar. He was a deist, and had long been occupied with a series of works of the most heterodox character. But he was a timid man, and had not ventured to publish any of them. Lessing had become acquainted with the daughter of Rimeris, and she placed the MSS in his hands. The principal treatise of Rimeris was an apology for reasonable believers in god which was written in a spirit of intense hostility to christianity blessing did not agree with many of the opinions expressed in it but he believed it would be a good thing to give the work to the world first because it would further the cause of religious toleration and secondly because it would put the believers in christianity on their mettle but it was impossible to get the work published because of the severe censorship exercised over the press at berlin however at brunswick he got permission to publish some fragments from other papers of rimeris he began in seventeen seventy four with quote, toleration of deists end quote. this was succeeded by other fragments to which he gave the general title of quote, 
something more from the papers of the anonymous writer concerning revelation end quote. there were five papers in all they contained attacks on the credibility of the old testament and the new as daring as voltaire's or as any which have been made since one of them comments on the contradictions of the evangelists in their account of the resurrection contending that the resurrection was a fable that the disciples carried christ's body away and deliberately deceived the world by a fictitious narrative thus Rimerus anticipated strauss and modern historians to put it comprehensively he attempted to demolish the historical foundations of christianity and in thus shaking or demolishing its foundations he imagined that he was demolishing christianity itself that it was attached to historical fact and that with the failure of the fact what was attached to it would collapse of the enormous sensation which the publication of these papers made and of the controversies in which they involved lessing i need say nothing what concerns us are the commentaries which lessing published with these Ramirez fragments with many of the opinions of Ramirez, he was by no means in accordance and his attitude is that of an apologist for christianity against the attacks of Ramirez, just the position of browning he protests against the confusion between faith and reason which are constantly assumed to be one whereas they are not one but entirely different he says that reason once for all accepts revelation and that having done so it has no right to require that the mysteries of religion shall be made intelligible as Rimerus had required Rimerus had assumed that because the old testament does not teach the immortality of the soul it could not be regarded as a revelation lessing asks why a revelation should be supposed to communicate absolute final truth god taught man by degrees his teachings being adapted to that stage in intelligence and culture reached by those to whom they were communicated here he develops the theory advanced in his quote, education of the human race end quote, of a progressive revelation when with regard to the attacks on the credibility of the witnesses on the subject of the resurrection he argues that the contradictions are not those of the actual witnesses but those who report what the actual witnesses had seen and that if they did contradict themselves as very likely the actual witnesses would have done that would prove nothing for no witnesses give precisely the same account of what they have seen then lessing flashes into this parenthesis note it carefully for our purpose in parenthesis the broad fact is that the cause which depended upon the credible evidence of these witnesses is one christianity has triumphed over the heathen and jewish religions it is here in italic but the grand key passage is this suppose all the objections urged in the fragments were proved to be well founded suppose it were necessary to give up the bible altogether what then would it be necessary also to give up christianity by no means the theologian might be perplexed the christian would remain unaffected what has a christian to do with the hypothesis the explanations the proofs of the theologian to him it is once for all there the christianity which he feels to be so true and in which he feels himself so happy if the paralytic experiences the beneficial shock of the electric spark what does it matter to him whether nolet or franklin or neither of them is right in short the letter is not the spirit and the bible is not religion consequently accusations against the letter and the bible 
are not also accusations against the spirit and against religion. End of that quotation. In his, quote, Education of the Human Race, end quote, which also grew out of this controversy, his main thesis is that what education is to the individual, revelation is to the race. Education is revelation coming to the individual man, and revelation is education which has come and is yet coming to the human race. The first revelation God gave was a conception given to an individual of the one God. Next, he selected an individual people, the Hebrew people, and revealed himself to them as the God of their nation, the one God, not teaching them the immortality of the soul, for they were not ripe for it, but the doctrine of rewards and punishment on earth. So familiarizing them with himself under these conditions, he fitted them for the further revelation which came with Christ, who was the first certain practical teacher of the immortality of the soul, making that the central point of his teaching. So mankind went on in progressive education, from primer to primer, in each of which they were successfully drilled, till they were fitted for the next. On what lines will the further development for the next revelation proceed? He sees one of the germs in it in the doctrine of the Trinity. How, he says, if this doctrine should at last, after endless errors, bring men on the road to recognize that God cannot possibly be one in the sense in which finite things are one, that even his unity must be a transcendental unity, which does not exclude a sort of plurality. But in some form developing out of the old, this further revelation will assuredly come, the time of the new eternal gospel which is promised us in the primer of the New Testament itself. But is it not here with us now, this further revelation which Lessing thus anticipated? And has it not come in the form in which he anticipated it would come? Namely, in the increasing subordination of what may be called the accidents of Christianity to its essence, in the increasing indifference to dogma, to the niceties of ritual, to all that we mean by, quote, the letter, End quote, in the proportionately increasing sense of the power and beauty of the spirit, of the substance, in the gradually predominating conviction that Christianity means neither this body of dogmas nor that, neither this institution and system nor that, means not the scaffoldings of the initiatory stages of the early fabric nor the accretions doctrinal, political, and otherwise, which have gathered on it since. But the acceptance of God in Christ, this and all that this involves, practically in conduct, inspiringly in aspiration, and endeavor, spirituality in faith. Thus is Christianity, the shackles fettering it to this form or that form, gradually falling off, expanding illimitably, mingling itself, though without losing its identity, with universal truth. This is a Christianity of Lessing and Browning. If we turn to what we will, turn now to, quote, a death in the desert, end quote we shall see how much there is in connection between them as apologists of Christianity and how much Browning is apparently indebted to Lessing. If he was not, the parallels are at least interesting. Their position and purpose are similar. Lessing urged his arguments in defense of Christianity against the attacks of Rimeris, Browning against the attacks of Strauss and his school. 
Rymeris and Strauss suppose that in demolishing the historical foundations of Christianity, they were destroying the thing itself. Lessing and Browning contended that the truth of Christianity is independent of its historical proof. What concerns us now is not how, in italics, we got Christianity and how it grew up, but that we have it, in italics. Take an illustration of Browning's. Prometheus, says the fable, stole fire from heaven. Well, if he did, he did. There were various traditions about his having stolen the fire, and serious discrepancies in them. What does it matter? We have got fire. Are we going to reject fire because we are not satisfied about its origin, and find inconsistencies in the traditions about its origin? Are we going to reject Christianity because we are not satisfied with evidence, which we are absolutely incompetent to investigate? and estimate, though we have the thing itself, a living, energizing fact, a step in the ladder of progress on which we must mount if we are to ascend. John saw Christ, heard, touched him. Soul that does. What he saw and heard was registered on and by the next faculties, which also used that knowledge reflected on it, willed on it, soul that knows. All these molded and made what constitutes the spiritual personality, the immortal, quote, I, end quote, which survives death, soul that is. The first two fade and perish with the body. The last is the imperishable, quote, I, end quote. To put it more clearly, Christ was seen and heard by his disciples. There was once then testimony, the testimony of the soul that does. They reflected on what they had seen and heard. Then was the testimony of the soul that knows. That has passed away with them and with their mortal life. But there is also what Christianity affected and accomplished what it molded and made of them, the testimony of the soul that is. St. John thinks, how will it be with a belief in Christ in the future, when the testimony of the soul that does and the soul that knows is no longer possible? He has had an indication even in his own lifetime. Quote, when, end quote, he said, quote, I heard and saw Christ, gave men the testimony of the soul that does, men believed. When I gave them the testimony of the soul that knows, they also believed. But when I taught the truth in itself, thinking that it could go on and make way on its own strength, refuting doubts by its own intrinsic virtue and power, I found I made no impression. So I found that men attached more importance to the fact that I saw Christ and was inspired at Patmos than to the testimony of the truth itself. In the far future, men will perhaps question whether ever I existed, whether I ever saw what I did see and will reject the truth because it is not proved by the testimony of personal assurance, by the testimony of the soul which is even now failing me. End quote. To him, close on physical dissolution with the material veil which intervenes between the spirit and spiritual, truth thinning and falling off, all is clear. All is in italics. The miracle of Christ's life and death, the need and the transparency of sin and death, the ubiquity of God's love in the world, in a word, the truth and the power of Christ's message. All this to him, italicized, 
is needing not the testimony of the soul that acts or the soul that knows for now all is clear to the vision of the soul that is quote, but to you end quote, addressing his disciples quote, to you before whose soul is the veil of the flesh the veil of youth and strength how shall i make it clear i must furnish you as it were with an optic glass which shall enable you to see succinct distinct small and clear in proper perspective not the grand universal immense truth in all its universality and immensity but that truth contracted as it were to plain historic fact that having been made plain and realized then you will have the vision of what i have End quote. life is given to us that we may learn the truth but the soul does not learn as the flesh does the flesh grasps it at once man needs no second proof of the worth of fire he troubles himself nothing about prometheus and tradition but accepts it at once but spiritual truths are not accepted like that we may know the worth of christ as we know the value of fire but we cannot in the same way grasp this truth in our lives then st john goes on to anticipate the objections that will be raised in the far future against his gospel they will say quote, your tales are not proved miracles that prove doctrine go for naught you say that christ embodied love and power but accepting the incarnation of love and power does it follow that the divine christ existed man having that affection in his heart may have read it into a fable just as man did in his mental infancy read his own emotions and conceptions into nature capital n for nature End quote. these objections st john then answered on the lines of lessing's treatise quote, i say that man was made to grow not to stop End quote. what helped him when he needed help is withdrawn when its end is served and nothing shall prove twice what once was proved the truth needed the help of miracles as a garden plot with young seeds in it is protected with twigs when the herbs wave it is no longer for old twigs you look the miracles were wrought as a matter of fact but what concerns mankind is not the truth of the miracle but the truth originally confirmed and aided by the miracles the acknowledgment of god in christ Quote, wouldst thou unprove this to reprove the proved in life's mere minute with power to use that proof leave knowledge and revert to how it sprung thou hast it use it and forthwith or die exactly lessing's argument you will remember Quote, for i say this is death and the soul death when a man's loss comes to him from his gain darkness from light from knowledge ignorance the lack of love from love made manifest death in the desert suppose when god gave the first revelation man needed namely that there was a might in italicis behind the might of nature capital n god himself man had said quote, since all is might what use of will End quote. and had become merely apathetic when god gave him the second revelation namely that there was love behind the might is he going to turn round and say when he sees love everywhere quote, since such love is everywhere and since ourselves can love and would be loved we ourselves make the love and christ was not rejecting christ quote, through very need of him End quote. if he does so the lamp or swims with oil the stomach flags loaded with nurture and that man's soul dies 
This is all from death in the desert. But why, it may be asked, did God perplex the revelation of truth by presenting it in such an unsatisfactory form? The answer is, because man can only be educated gradually. He must gain truth circuitously, pass from old to new, from vain to real, from mistake to fact. His distinctive mark is a capacity for progress. Quote, Lower than God who knows all and can all, higher than beasts which know and can so far as each beast's limit, perfect to an end. End quote. And this progress would be impossible under other conditions than the conditions under which he is placed with respect to action and with respect to to education. Quote, God's gift was that man should conceive of truth and yearn to gain it, catching at mistake, as midway help till he reach fact indeed. End quote. If we reject such truth as we are under these conditions able to acquire, the penalty on us will be that we shall never attain the ultimate truth. So St. John anticipates and answers those who would reject Christianity because those were the conditions under which it was presented to us. Browning is here, as in many other parts of his writings, developing the grand passage in Lessing's quote, duplic, end quote. Quote, not the truth of which a man is or believes himself to be possessed, but the sincere effort he has made to come behind the truth makes the worth of the man. For not through the possession, but through the investigation of truth, does he develop those energies in which alone consists his ever-growing perfection. Possession makes the mind stagnant, indolent, proud. If God held enclosed in his right hand all truth, and in his left simply the ever-moving impulse towards truth, although with the condition that I should always be erring, and said to me, quote, choose, end quote, I should humbly bow before his left hand and say, quote, Father, give from this. Pure truth is for thee alone, end quote. How far all this is satisfactory, we must each decide for ourselves. To many, and probably to very many, Browning's thesis and arguments will seem, in the main at least, a tissue of unwarrantable hypothesis and equally unwarrantable conclusions, and to raise exceedingly ingenious exercise in logical dialectic, but little more. To many, it will probably appear that all which is worth serious consideration in his argument is what he has in common with Lessing. And this is surely important. It was not a sophistical answer to the school of Rimeris and Strauss to say that the truth of Christianity depends on testimony which historical and philological criticisms cannot shake and that the Christian can afford to concede the justice of much which his opponents have urged against the authenticity of the Bible without any apprehension as to the soundness of the credentials of his creed. Again, Lessing's theory of a progressive revelation, also adopted by Browning, is such as must recommend itself to most thoughtful people. It finds so much corroboration in obvious facts. It suggests so much. It explains so much. End of section 16